All right, in this video, we're going to talk about diffusion models. Um, I actually recorded a video very similar to this about a year ago now, but I've now updated it to include uh, new things. So if you're watching the initial parts of the slides here and you're like, I think I've seen this one already, I promise there's more at the end, um, so keep watch there. So uh, diffusion models are what powers Midjourney, Dolly, Stable Diffusion, Firefly, all these things. And I want to talk a little about what they do, why they work, and why they work the way they do, especially with text to image. So the ideal goal of this is essentially when, you know, when people started using machine learning, these deep learning models, you know, they were looking for how to, how to, how to use these, like, what do they do it for text? How do they create images using these things? Right? So the goal is how do we teach a machine learning model to create images, um, for centuries, or I guess, I don't know, for as long as computers have existed in many, many, many ways, we've had sort of like a, oh, you must draw this shape and then this shape and then this shape. But having that sort of programmatic language doesn't really work for machine learning. So we have to think about how to train this in a certain way. And for the diffusion process, all of them utilize more or less the same core concept. There might be some slight variations in how they work. Um, as we get further into this process, people find new ways to sort of tweak things or find little hacks in the process. But essentially, they all work the same. So they take a data set of images, and they add noise to the image. Now you might be asking yourself, like, why add noise? Like, that doesn't make sense. Uh, and we'll explain it in just a second. So basically, by adding noise to an image, the model learns to actually noise an image, right? It learns how to add noise to an image. And that might sound kind of simplistic or kind of stupid, but it's important to this process. So let's say we've got a photo of a cat. What we want to do is we want to train the model to actually add noise. And you want to add noise in a way that is, you know, slowly iterative, right? So we're slowly adding noise. This scene, you can still see some of the cat. This one, if you knew it was a cat, you might be able to still see the cat. And at this step, it is completely noise. It is completely, you know, randomly generated color noise. Now, the goal of this is once we train a machine learning model how to do that in one direction, we can also learn to remove noise from an image. So again, we've got this. We go one direction, so we learn how to add noise. And the model then, uh, sort of by the way these models work, is they also learn to remove noise. And once you learn to remove noise, now you can start to generate images, right? So now I can take a noisy image and I can start to generate an image from it because I've learned how this process works, right? So I might say, okay, let's start by adding a little bit of outline here in the way the body of the cat works. Um, this cat in particular needs, you know, uh, a little bit of brown on its face. So we start to add the brown back in, maybe some eyes, maybe some background, and then eventually we get the full image. This is what diffusion models are. Uh, they basically learn to invert a noising process. Um, and that's sort of important. And the reason I believe they're called diffusion is if you've ever used diffuse paper or whatever, it kind of blurs everything. Um, there are diffusion processes that use blurring instead of noise, but we've sort of learned that noise tends to work better for a couple different reasons. Most of that having to do with it injects color into it, which is helpful for a lot of our tooling. Now remember, these models are what we call deep learning models. So they're what's on the right. So a model on the left would be, I don't know, more of a classifier model. You take an image in and you figure out what it is. On the right-hand side, we actually have this process because if you, again, take a look at our noising image here, we don't just want to immediately jump to generating the body shape because that might not always work, right? In this case, we're almost working off pixels. We're able to learn how to change a pixel into a shape. And that's sort of what uh, deep learning models are great at. So in this example, we could almost think about this. And this is actually more or less how these models work is there is a layer, a hidden layer, a sort of a, a, a neural network layer that allows us to convert pixels to edges. Then there is another layer that learns to convert edges into shapes, shapes into compositions, and then at the very end we get our image out. This is where deep learning really like shines. So it's able to take those pixels and convert it into a shape in a way that is probabilistic. Remember, these are always prob probability models. So it's able to say, well, if I see a green pixel next to a lighter green pixel, that's the start of grass or the start of a line. And then that line becomes a blade of grass and that grass becomes a part of a grassy field or something. Now we've got a problem here. If we look at this image just from the start, from pure noise, probabilistically, like this image could be almost anything. And the reality is that diffusion models existed for a long time before text image models did. And um, in fact, we kind of found they didn't work that well. And they didn't work that well because often when you're starting from a very noisy image, it could realistically be anything. Um, so there were diffusion models that only made cats. Um, they were trained on just a data set of cats, and it would learn to take noise and turn it into a cat, and it worked okay. The key 
finding sort of as a part of this process was to add another element of probability into our system. And that's where text conditioning or the text to image model uh, sort of concept came from. So if we think of the probability of this pixel and this pixel turning into a certain shape, what we can also then layer in is, well, I want a shape in the form of a cat. And that then helps the model move uh, further along and sort of probably understand this thing. So let's talk a little bit about that process. So back in the day, and actually still to this point, um, the model that was mostly used was a model called Clip. OpenAI, who also made ChatGPT, happened to have invented or made Clip. And uh, since they made DALI initially, a lot of um, teams sort of gathered how Clip worked and use Clip as their model. Uh, so the, the, the backstory of this is that when OpenAI released DALI, they did not release the DALI, the image generation model, but they did open source Clip. And people were able to sort of reverse engineer Clip into an image generator or combine Clip plus an image generator to create things. So if you look maybe three, four years ago, there were models called VQGAN-Clip or VQGAN plus Clip. That was the VQGAN was the model that was generating the images and then Clip was the conditional operation on top of that probability score. Let's talk a little bit about how this works because I think it'll make more sense once you see this. So let's say I enter in a text prompt and I say, I'm looking for a beautiful painting of a dog riding a dolphin. When I add and generate my image using that first step, right, that very first part of the noisy image is going to be very noisy. And I should say the noisy images I was showing earlier are not actually the kind of noise we produce now. Um, we've produced that noise in the past, but now we kind of have a more flat kind of looking noise. It's still very, it's still pure noise, but it's less of that like very salt and peppery noise. Um, anyway, <laughs> as an aside, um, so when you take a text prompt plus an in image, what Clip does is it scores this combination. It says, how good of an image is this compared to my text prompt? And it provides a score. Now, the scoring is different than this, but let's just say, for example, that like we basically gave this almost a zero, right? Like this is like a terrible example of a beautiful painting of a dog riding a dolphin. Clip therefore says, hey, this is pretty bad. You should think about changing this. This is what we call a step. And when we look at um, maybe some open source models or even mid-journey, there is an option in there to apply the number of steps you want to the images. Now, other models have sort of removed this feature, um, but especially when you look at stable diffusion and when we look at comfy UI, you'll see there's literally a line in that tool that says, how many steps do I want to run? Um, so a step is how many times we do this process of creating an image, scoring it based on the text prompt, and then we take our next step. And our next step should guide this image generation model to a better looking version, right? So we start with pure noise, and as we slowly remove the noise, we also improve our image based on the clip model using a scoring system like this. So if this is step one, maybe step 50, meaning 50 steps from noise almost to our complete image, we now have a slightly better image, right? I can kind of see a dog maybe riding a dolphin here. I almost see the dog, um, but I can tell that I'm in an ocean or I can tell that this is a place where a, where a dolphin might live. So when we score this, you know, at step 50, um, Clip says, yeah, not, not bad. Like we definitely need to do more, but we're getting closer. And by the time we're finished, we now have an image that accurately maps, you know, our Clip score to our text prompt to our image prompt. Now, Again, this percentage is not really how it works, but it gets it's, it's more or less an analogy of how this works. So this process of slowly updating the image using both our noise probability, which is the diffusion model, plus our clip model or a text conditional model, um, we are able to generate better images. Now, this is why um, a model like DALI or a model like Midjourney is able to generate so many different types of images. Because before, when we just had our noised image, um, we could try to get it to generate anything, but it would, it's too hard. There's too many probabilities for that noised image to become anything. But by combining the noised image and the clip score, this is why it works so well, because we're able to use the, the, the text model to guide the image uh, shaping into the image we want. Now, obviously, when this first started four or five years ago, uh, the images were not nearly as good as what you see here, right? So. We've trained on lots of data, we've improved our models, we've improved some of the functionality that I'm describing at a very basic level here. And we now get really beautiful images like this dog that rides a dolphin. Um, my video from a year or two ago, uh, our dog on a dolphin did not look nearly as nice as this. Um, but now we're getting to a place where these are pretty damn good. 
Now this also introduces this idea of our text. Well, how do we make the best text to guide the image into our into the best place it can be? And obviously we talked a little bit about prompt engineering and we've talked about how text can use that latent space to guide it into the best latent space. And that's essentially what we need to do for images as well. So prompt engineering is just as important in image generation as it is in text generation. But the actual process or the actual way of doing that is slightly different. Um, one of the things we've learned is that just clip loves certain specific keywords, um, as well as your image model might be combined with certain keywords. So finding those keywords is uh, the best way to optimize your image output. And at least a couple of years ago, maybe it's a little bit different now, but uh, people used to find like very weird and simple hacks in order to generate better images. Um, so again, this is probably from a year and a half, two years ago now. Um, if you wanted more detailed images, the way you would do this is you would actually say uh, in your text prompt something like needle point abyss. I can't believe the detail in the needlework. And the reason you would ask for I can't believe the detail is again, these models would scrape data from across the internet and you know someone would show a great image and then someone would reply like, I can't believe the detail in this image. It looks really good. And the model would be conditioned on those two things together and would start to learn, hey, if someone says, I can't believe the detail, then you show a lot of detail in the image. Um, and this is prompt engineering, right? Like it's kind of reverse engineering how the model thinks and then you apply your sort of concept of the model to these processes. Um, and I think this is really fascinating and interesting. Um, I would say models like Midjourney have kind of removed the need for this. But if you look at stuff like Stable Diffusion, um, you still need to include a lot of like little tricks and, and techniques like this. Um, Midjourney has become so good that it almost removes a lot of the uh, need for really strong prompt engineering. And that's because, again, they've actually conditioned those models on additional things, which we'll talk about maybe a little bit toward the end of end of this session. But prompt engineering, really fascinating concept. Now, one of the key things, just like what we learned with LLMs, is you have to be very direct and very obvious with a, these models about what you're trying to achieve. Um, they often fail when you ask for something that is more metaphorical, right? So if I say, I want a fork in the road, uh, you will get quite a literal translation of that. You will get a fork in the road. Um, I haven't tried this again in a couple years. This is already to a year and a half a year old. Um, but this is a great example of just like with LLMs, you have to be very explicit about what you're trying to achieve. Um, and you cannot really mix with metaphors. So if you actually want a fork in the road, you would say um, two roads uh, converge um, in a forest or something, or two roads converge in a, a five lane highway or something. Um, and this is again, sort of the conceptual idea behind prompt engineering is if you start to think like the machine, you can talk to the machine and the machine will generate what you want. So I will cover an, a later in this video, uh, or sorry, later in, in another video, um, all of the different prompt engineering tools that are available to you, how to write good prompts, that sort of thing. Um, but what I want to talk a, a little bit about is in the past year or so, that we've also started to see a number of models or a number of tools that also add what I would call additional conditioning. Now remember, conditioning is just simply another probability score that can be applied to a model. So right now you've got the probability of the noisy pixels becoming an image. You've got the probability of your text uh, conditioning model generating the right pro the right image from your text. And now we've added in a bunch of other layers to these tools. Um, so these could take in multiple text prompts, right? There are ways to generate multiple text prompts at different steps to generate sort of a, a blended image, that sort of thing. Um, but what we'll also look at is ways to even use other images in order to influence our prompt. Um, so let's take a look at some of these options now. So the first one is what is commonly referred to as initial Im imaging or image initialization. Um, this is the idea that what if instead of that noisy, you know, pure noise, um, if you think about maybe the middle step there where we've got that cat that's kind of outlined, um, but it maybe just looks like more blobs with some noise in it. Um, what if we actually took an image, noise that image and put it in the middle of our process? Wouldn't we take that step, that 50% step, and if we generate off of that, we would get something that looked very similar to our image. That's what initialized images. So in this case, I would pass in um, our text prompt. I would then pass in an image, and we'll talk about waiting in a little bit, but let's say I wanna inject this image at 75% of my process, right? So I wanna take the image and add just a little bit of noise to it. When you do that and you run it through this process, you will get an image that looks quite similar to your previous image. Um, in this case, you know I get something that looks dog-like, 
um, and some of it looks dolphin-like, but more or less looks exactly like my image here. And because there's no dog in this image, it really struggles to actually generate the dog. It kind of generates, I don't know, like a more iconographic dog. Now, not every tool allows you to do this. Um, I'm using Stable Diffusion here. Like, you cannot do this in Midjourney. Um, you can't do it in Dali. Um, so only certain tools allow you to do this. And this is other other challenge for why you might choose one model over another. Um, I do want to talk a little about the weighting process here, um, W-E-I-G-H-T. Um, so in this case, I'm also saying how strongly this image should influence my output. Um, if I turn this down even just a little bit, I get a very different image. Um, so you'll see here I'm saying, hey, inject this at, say, 70% done with just a little bit of noise. In this one, I'm saying add, a, add more noise to that image. And again, as we denoise it, the image turns out very different. Now, you might look at this image and say, how does this influence this? But if you do look here, this whole left-hand side is very blue. And this right-hand side here is very pur pinkish, purple. Um, and that corresponds directly to our image. So the less weight or the less, in the less influence this, this image has on the image, um, the more you'll pick up just colors and less of the actual shapes. And this is where some people are able to change very little details of an image um, versus changing the image entirely, but having still some control over this by using stuff like these color palettes. Now, this gets confusing because there's also a thing called image prompting. And image prompting is different in that this image does not have a direct influence on the actual image. Um, it is instead a way of generating a prompt from this image, uh, meaning it's more or less like the text. It's not exactly the text, but it's like the text. Um, so if I include both a text and an image, then I can generate an image that has sort of stylistically the same look and feel of this without this image influencing the actual shapes that are here. So you'll see, like this brings in a lot of these like blues and pinks and purples, that sort of radiant color shapes, those sort of things, and maybe has a little bit of influence in the overall shape, right? I've got you know one animal kind of going this way, another animal going this way. Now again, different tools allow this or don't allow this. Um, this is a thing that Midjourney does allow, and uh, in a future session we'll look at how to use Midjourney with this tool because um, it's actually quite powerful and allows you to create a lot of aesthetic influences without maybe taking on the exact shape. Um, and Midjourney is great at this because Midjourney already has really good aesthetic values. Um, so you don't necessarily need to override the, the shape or the orientation of the image, but you can influence it with these stylistic uh, inputs. And the last thing I want to talk about are what are called control nets or T2Is. There's a couple different names for these things. Now, control nets actually take in what I would describe as like a structural image, meaning they can take in a depth mask or they can take in a, a very crappy a sketch here of a dog on a dolphin. Uh, this would be like a scribble network. They can also take in body poses um, using a pose network or those sort of things. Um, and these are quite powerful because these allow for compositional control. Um, if you've ever used Midjourney, you know that like if you want a person on the left and you say, show me a person on the left side of the screen, you don't always get a person on the left side of the screen because these models, the way the text is in input, it's not always taking the positional argument. In fact, it's almost always never taking the positional argument. So if you want to control output of shapes or um, you know, just overall composition, you can use these control nets to influence this output. Now again, these are all probability scores. Um, the probability of a image that looks like this being converted into an image like this versus you know, one of the previous images we saw of a dog and a dolphin, right? I've sort of specified exactly what I want this to look like in terms of shapes, and it learns to represent that. Now again, uh, this is a tool you cannot use through Midjourney, um, but Stable Diffusion and other open source tools do allow it. So here's a good example of, you know, again, maybe the output of the image is not quite good. I could do more prompt engineering. I could uh, mess with additional conditional logic, like that sort of thing. But I am able to at least control what the image looks like. And clearly, like, I meant this to be a moon here, but it meant it to be, I don't know, like a, a stingray shark looking thing. Um, but in the past year and a half, two years, we are seeing far more ability to control these models and have some influence on them. And that's really where we want to go, right? We want to have total control over these tools while also leveraging the power of these image generation capabilities. Um, so that's everything I want to cover in this video. Um, I hope you found it helpful. In the next video, we're going to look at how to actually uh, work on our prompts and some tips around how to do uh, good prompt engineering specifically for image generation.